Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Columbia State Historic Park. We will get started in about 30 seconds or so. I want to make sure everybody has a chance to hop on in. So just sit tight and we'll get started right about 9.01. All right, good morning again, everybody. My name is Caleb Mascalier, and I work for California State Parks, like it says right here on my patch. And I'm up here at Columbia State Historic Park. And I want to welcome everyone to our Cinco de Mayo Horts Cast. So this program should last about 40 or so minutes. We're going to go over a little bit of the history here of the state of California, some of the bigger contributions of our Hispanic gold miners, especially here in Colombia. And then we will check out a little bit about the Battle of Puebla, why it's important for our history here, and why Cinco de Mayo became a holiday here that's celebrated in the United States. And I do want to tell y'all, Cinco de Mayo is not celebrating Mexico's independence. It is celebrating the victory at the Battle of Puebla. Now, I'm going to do a little 360 to show y'all where I am at in the park. And it is about 40 degrees here today. It's a little chilly. And we had some rain, but I think it's supposed to clear up a little bit later today. But it is still a beautiful day here in Colombia. And you might see a few people walking around here. It's still a bit early in the morning for our town. We are an actual town still, but uh, I could say most of the people are late risers. We'll get opened up like around 10 o'clock, but we are still an actual town here. And speaking of here, I'm gonna share my screen because I wanna show y'all on a map where I'm at in the state of California and in the United States. And since I'm on an iPhone, when I share my screen, it kind of turns sideways. All right, so here is the little town of Columbia. It is nestled in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada mountains. And the foothills, that's where gold miners from all around the world, 300,000 people, they rushed, rushed to the foothills starting in 1848. And they came from all around the world. And all these people came with that same idea. They had heard that there was gold in the hills, that there was free wealth just lying in the ground. And all of these people journeyed from around the world, hoping to strike it rich. And now we can see some cities near Columbia. If you are in the city of Stockton, I'm about an hour and 10 minutes east of you. If you're closer to Sacramento, I'm about an hour and 45 minutes south and a little east of you. If you are in the San Francisco Bay Area, I'm about three hours east of you. Then I'm gonna keep zooming out. And now we can see Los Angeles. So I am six hours north of Los Angeles and about eight hours north of San Diego. And I'm just gonna zoom out in case we have any friends from anywhere else in the world. You can see where I'm at in the United States. And I'm gonna zoom all the way out. And that is where Columbia is, one of the many gold rush towns that gold miners rushed to. Now we're gonna go on a little journey through history today. We're gonna start back with some California history and then journey through till we get to the Battle of Puebla and why we celebrate Cinco de Mayo. So when the gold rush started, the United States was still a very, very young country when you think about it. It wasn't that old yet. 
And I just want to point this out. A lot of our history that we have now is a little on the American centric side. We tend to focus on what just happened here and forget the influence of all these other countries around the world and how they influenced our country's growth and development. So we're going to start looking at some of the history here. Now, California, before it became part of the United States, was a part of Mexico. And I have a nifty little map to show y'all. So you can see what it looked like in the 1820s. This was way before the gold rush started. Whoops. We'll look at those pictures again later. Here we go. So here is what California looked like November 18th, 1824. It was part of Mexico. And the area that I am in was called Alta, California. And they, oh, they had a big piece of what is now the United States. It had California, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, New Mexico, Arizona, and even Texas. And this is what California looked like before it became part of the United States. Now, in 1836, a little piece of their territory declared its independence called the Republic of Texas. So that's when Texas declared its independence and they became their own country. Now, what ended up happening after that is the United States saw that. President James Polk saw that and that Texas wanted to become part of the United States. So in 1846, the United States declared war on Mexico so that they could grab Texas. There was a territorial dispute. That was pretty common in human history. And there was a long war, about two years. And after that war, in February of 1848, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was signed. That said, that the United States would now take possession of Texas and all the territory that was California, Oregon, Washington, and Idaho. So that all became part of California. And there were a lot of Mexican citizens already living here in California. They owned a lot of the ranches. And what happened to them is they went to bed at night as Mexican citizens, and then they woke up the next day as U.S. citizens. And this is what the North American continent kind of looked like right before the Mexican-American War. So you see the 14 free states right there in the red for the United States, the 15 slave states in Southern California. We have this little red area. That's what was disputed. That's why the United States went to war with Mexico right there. And then that kind of light yellow on the left is what Mexico owned till after the treaty. So these Mexican citizens went to sleep as citizens of Mexico. They woke up the next day as citizens of the United States. <clears throat> and many of these Mexican citizens would become some of the very first gold miners here in California. So now we're in 1848. And California became part of the United States about one month after gold was discovered. And here I'll ask you all a question and I'll give you a second to think about it. And then you can turn to a friend and if you know the answer, you can quietly tell them. Who was the man that officially discovered gold here in California? So I'll give you a few seconds to think about it. All right. If you answered James Marshall, you are correct. He is the man who officially discovered gold in January of 1848. And let's see if you remember where he was at when he discovered it. I'll give you a few seconds to think about that, too. And if you know the answer, you can quietly tell your neighbor. So if you said John Sutter's Mill, that is correct. And that city is now called Coloma, California. So that's when gold was officially discovered in January of 1848. Then California became part of the United States about a year later. 
But it took a while for the information to spread around the world, which is why we call most of those miners 49ers. It took about a year. But you see, our Mexican miners were already here. They heard about the gold rush really quick. They were only a week or so away to walk up into the hills to start mining. And speaking of mining, I'm going to show you some rocks here now. I'm going to flip my camera around. So you can check out one of the areas that they mined a lot of gold here in Colombia. These little dolomite rocks. They used to be underground, under about 20 to 30 feet of dirt. And our miners, our placer miners, came here. And they dug around all those rocks and the whole town of Colombia. The whole town of Colombia was a gold mine. And they were looking for gold there. Now, most of our miners knew how to plaster mine here in Colombia using only water as one of their main tools. But there's some other tools you can use. So I want you to think for a second. If you were a miner, what would you use to get gold out of these rocks? So I'll give you a few seconds to think about it, and then you can tell your neighbor if you would like to. All right, so I'm sure some of you said maybe a pickaxe, a shovel, or a gold pan, and those were all things that our placer miners would use. But we also had things like long toms and sluice boxes and rocker boxes. And I'm going to walk us down so I can show you a rocker box. We're going to journey over to our miner's shack. But as we're journeying there, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about what happened in February of 1848. So when the United States signed the treaty with Mexico, that treaty said that Mexican citizens in California were allowed to keep the land that they had already, since they already had a bunch of property and big ranches. They were allowed to keep that land, which means that those first miners were from Mexico. But we did have Hispanic miners from all over the world. We had a lot of Chilean and Peruvian miners as well. And most of our Hispanic miners were very, very experienced because of a gold rush in the South American country of Chile before the gold rush here. And that's very important. I want you to remember that because I'm going to show you how most of our American and European miners would gold mine here. And then I'm going to show you how our placer miners would, because this little device right here, well, it requires a lot of water. And I'm going to give you a few seconds if you want to think about what this thing is named. I mentioned it earlier. It has to do with this motion that I'm doing. This is a rocker box. Our gold miners also thought it looked a little bit like a baby cradle, so you could call it that too. But this was one of the primary tools that our US and European miners used. And I want you to think of it like a giant gold pan, and you're gonna rock it back and forth. I have some dirt on this already, and then we dump water on it. And that kind of rinses away all the mud. And hopefully what you're left with is gold at the bottom of this thing. And you see, it uses a lot of water. You need even more water than I was using. If you're going to use this all day, 12 hours a day, six days a week. And this is what our U.S. and European miners would use. But I don't know if you remember, you haven't seen too much of Colombia yet, but did anybody notice a river? or a lake, or a stream here? That's right, we don't have one. We don't have a natural supply of water here. That means that most of our European and our American miners, they didn't quite know what to do when the water dried up in the summer. We only had a seasonal stream. 
And speaking of stream, I want to tell you how Columbia was discovered. You see, gold was discovered in 1848, but Columbia wasn't discovered till March of 1850. And we have a couple different stories. All of them involve this little seasonal stream. One of them was that the Hildreth party, the people credited with officially discovering Columbia, were journeying through on a rainy day, kind of like today. And they got stuck in the rain, decided to dry out their gear. And then they saw this stream and they went gold panning. And you know what they found? Gold. They found a lot of it. And they went to the nearby city of Sonora where they filed a mining claim. And it would have been smart for them to keep their mouths shut, but one of them told somebody. And within a couple of weeks, an area that maybe only had a few people living here permanently had over 5,000 miners crowded around this stream. And that was one of the stories. One of the other ones, the one that we believe is more likely, is that the Hildreth party, which was led here by Dr. Thaddeus Hildreth, were wandering through from another claim when they noticed the seasonal stream was being mined by our Mexican gold miners. And since our Mexican and Chilean miners were very experienced, they were able to look at an area. They could read the terrain and know that there was gold there. So they knew that there was gold in Colombia just by looking at the terrain. So they went to that stream and they were pulling out gold. And the Hildreth party saw this, so they wandered over to the stream. But our uh, Mexican and Chilean miners were a little uneasy since there had just been a war with the United States a few years earlier. They decided that it was safer just to leave for a little bit. So they left. The Hildreth party found their gold and filed their claim. And that's how Colombia became a town. Now, after that seasonal stream dried up, our Mexican and Chilean miners came back here. That's because they knew a secret that our European and our U.S. gold miners did not. They knew how to placer mine without using water. And that's pretty important because it allowed them to stay here year round. Many of our Hispanic miners loved these southern mines because Colombia is part of the southern mine because there wasn't a lot of water. They could do what was called dry diggings. <laughs> and I'm going to show you a couple ways that they would do it. Now, if there was just one miner, you need a basket or maybe a wooden bowl. And you also need this. And if you think you know what this thing is, go ahead and quietly tell your neighbor. If you want to take a guess, now, what this very important tool is, some of you might even know. You may have read a book about it, about some miners. I think one of their names is uh, Praiseworthy, maybe, that they went around Cape Horn. This is a great horn spoon. So you would need your great horn spoon. You can use this end to chip through the hard dirt and that end to scoop it up. You're going to fill your basket up all with that dry dirt, and then you're going to shake it. And then we're going to toss it. And then we're going to shake it some more. And then we're going to toss it. And then whew, we're going to keep shaking, tossing. And well, you have to do a lot of shaking and tossing. And hopefully the wind will blow away all the dust. And since the gold's nice and heavy, well, it'll float back down into your basket or your bowl. And that technique that our Mexican and Chilean miners knew was called winnowing. But there were a lot of them here. So they didn't have to work by themselves. Most of them didn't. In fact, most of our Hispanic miners, when they came here, they actually brought their families with them. So they formed pretty big communities. And in the county that I'm in, Tuolumne County, for the first few years of the gold rush, the population was around 50 to 60 percent Hispanic. So there were a lot of them here, which means they would work together on these dry diggings. And the other way that you could dry mine like that was to grab a blanket. So go ahead and stick your hands out like this. We'll pretend I have an invisible blanket. So grab the invisible blanket with me. And then some of our friends here will shovel dirt. They'll use their pickaxes to break apart the dirt and shovel it onto the blanket. And then we got to do this. So what we're doing is trying to toss all the dirt into the air so the wind blows it away. And since the gold's nice and heavy, it'll float back down. All right, thanks for helping me toss my invisible blanket. And that was one of the other techniques that they had. And I actually have a nifty little picture to show you of this winnowing. 
So give me a second to pull it up. And then I'm gonna show you another picture. And all of these mining techniques were important because it allowed our miners to stay here year round. All right, so here is a nice little lithograph. That's what they call this kind of drawing of winnowing. And you can see that the wind is blowing away all of that dust. And I also wanna make a quick note, since it's black and white, you might think that the clothing that people wore in the gold rush was boring. It wasn't. Everybody had super, super bright and colorful clothing, way more colorful than what we wear today. It's just most of the pictures were black and white. So we don't notice that. But I just wanted to point that out to you. So this was winnowing. But there was one other one that our miners knew how to do here. And that was, first off, they would look for this. And take a guess. Do you think you know what this rock is? Because this is a pretty important little rock. This is called quartz. And gold is normally found in it. There was gold in this piece of quartz. It's nice and rusty there. I got it from a hard rock mine nearby. And that is what our Mexican and Chilean miners would also look for because they had another device. And this device was something that eventually many of the gold miners here in Colombia would use when they formed big companies because you don't need as much water. But the quartz is pretty hard. But our miners found a way to grind it into dust. And they used something called an arastra. And I'm gonna show you a picture of it right here. So what you do is this little rock is tied to it. You throw all your quartz in there and you have a donkey, a burrow. Walk in a circle and it grinds it into pieces and the gold will fall into those little cracks. And you can, you can do even bigger versions of this. Much, much bigger versions. And this type of mining was introduced to us by our Mexican and Chilean miners. They each had their own little arastra. And the techniques that they would teach the other miners helped form some of those large gold mining companies here in Colombia, which were responsible for pulling out some of the $87 million worth of gold that they found here in Colombia. So those were some of our Hispanic miners' contributions to gold mining. But they had a lot more contributions even to the state of California. And I'm gonna walk us over to the house of an old gold mine owner, the uh, Martinez house. But I wanna tell you about some of the contributions from the Latino community to the state of California's constitution. So when California became a state in September of 1850, we already had the gold rush. It was already going. And it took two years to become a state because people were arguing over whether California should be a slave state or a free state because we still had slavery in the United States of America at that point. Now, Mexico as a country, the Republic of Mexico was a free country. They had outlawed slavery. And since we had such a large Hispanic population here, they helped influence California into becoming a free state. And they helped write the first California constitution. And this is the Martinez house here. And this is important too, because the lady that lived here was a owner of a gold mine. And this is another influence from our Hispanic community here. You see in the United States, if you were a woman during the gold rush, you couldn't own a business. So here, imagine this, if we are in, let's say New York City or maybe Boston, Massachusetts. If you were a woman and your husband owned a shoe store, 
and he passed away. Something bad happened. He passed away. She would have six months to remarry or the business would be sold and the money would be given to her husband's nearest male relative. Our Hispanic community here helped influence California laws. It wasn't put in the Constitution right away. About two years after we became a state, they helped pass a law called the Soul Trader Act. That said that if you were a married woman here in California, you were able to own your own business. So that allowed the women here to own and operate their own businesses. And one of those women that owned a business was Elisa Martinez. She was the owner of a very, very large mine outside of town and a very successful mine. See, most miners in the gold rush didn't strike at rich, but Elisa was different. She was able to make a fortune here and she was able to own and operate that business thanks to the Soul Trader Act that came about from the influence of our Hispanic community here. And those are just some of the influences that they had on California becoming a state and some of the laws that we had early on. Now, they did try to pass a few other laws at the start, but they weren't quite successful. But they were successful with the Soul Trader Act and making sure that California came into the United States as a state that was a free state. So we didn't allow slavery here. And this was important too, because this is the 1850s. This is a few years before the American Civil War and some of the many events that would lead up to the Civil War. So now that we've explored some of our California history here, some of our broader history, oh, and I almost forgot to tell you, did you know that when California first became a state that the Constitution of California, the first one we had in 1850, was written in two languages and that you were able to conduct businesses in conduct business in California in two different languages. Do you want to guess what they were? All the businesses in California were able to conduct sales in English and Spanish. And the state constitution was written in English and Spanish thanks to the large Hispanic influence that we had here. So remember, at that point, too, we were still around 50% Hispanic population in the state of California, especially in this little town here. And because of that, too, there were a lot of Hispanic newspapers, Spanish newspapers all around the state of California. And I'll tell you about those a, a little bit later. But I want to jump forward in history now. So we looked at 1852. We are now going to look at the 1860s. So the Mexican Republic was a country, they were still young too, and they had to borrow money. We had to borrow money when we first became a country in the 1700s. And they borrowed money from the British Empire, the Spanish Empire, and the French Empire. And they had some troubles, that happens sometimes. So they said, hey, we can't pay our debts for two years. Well, England, Spain, and France didn't quite like that, so they got together, which is pretty rare. These three empires did not like each other, so it was very rare for them to do something together. And they went and invaded Mexico to get them to pay their debt back. And those three empires won the war. Those three empires had pretty much invaded anybody. They would have had a lot of trouble. Even we would have had some trouble had they done that. But they got Mexico to pay back their debt. But the French decided that, well, they kind of liked that little slice of America. Spain and England said, we got our money, and they left. But the French Empire decided that they wanted to stay here and expand their empire. But you see, we had a little thing here in the United States. And it's something I encourage you to Google, but it was something called the Monroe Doctrine. And that was something that the United States told all the other European countries, you don't get to come here anymore and expand your empire or you're going to have to fight us, which we would have done when the French invaded Mexico 
except we were fighting ourselves. You see, the United States Civil War started on April 12th, 1861, one of the bloodiest conflicts in American history. And France, seeing that uh, we were fighting ourselves, that the Union and the Confederacy was fighting, decided to wait till December 8th, 1861, about eight months after the American Civil War had started. And they decided to use the ploy again of, oh, we're going to collect a debt again. And they invaded Mexico. And this war was pretty long. And on May 5th, 1862, French forces battled with the Mexican army at the city of Puebla. And this is where Cinco de Mayo comes from. Now, from a military standpoint, this Mexican victory wasn't tactically significant, but it was still very important for the citizens of Mexico and the Californios here, because this was a very dark time. At this point in the American Civil War, the Union had been constantly losing. They had been losing battle after battle. And the same thing was happening to the Mexican army. So just imagine that, seeing your home country losing battle after battle and the country you're in fighting somebody else and losing battle after battle. This was a very dark time. So this victory at the Battle of Puebla was very important in this dark time. It was kind of like a little light in the darkness. And what ended up happening was these outnumbered and outgunned Mexican forces, the Mexican military there, beat a French army. And they didn't just beat any French army. They beat a French army that hadn't lost a single battle in 50 years. So this victory was very embarrassing for the French army. And here's a little drawing of what the Battle of Puebla looked like. And again, this wasn't necessarily important as far as military strategy goes, but it was very important for morale, how people were feeling at that time. And these outnumbered and outgunned Mexican forces defeated the French army. They kept trying to take this city that was on a little hill here, and they kept beating them back and beating them back every single time the French tried to push through and break these walls. And they didn't surrender. And eventually, the French forces decided to give up. They realized they weren't going to win. They didn't have the manpower to actually defeat the little Mexican army there. So the Mexican army at the Battle of Puebla was victorious. Now, Mexico would eventually go on to lose this war. But this victory was very important for all of our Californios and Mexican citizens. It brought them together. It united them. They felt very patriotic that their fellow citizens had won this battle here. And the battle also angered the French emperor, Napoleon III. You see, he was pretty mad that his army that hadn't been defeated in 50 years got beat by people that they outnumbered and outgunned excuse me, outgunned. And what was happening at this point in the Civil War is France had been meeting with the Confederacy and talking about becoming allies with them. They were going to help the Confederacy fight the Union. So this victory here, since it angered Napoleon, he decided to send his 30,000 troops at the Mexican army instead. That's eventually why they would lose, but because he sent those 30,000 troops to the fight the Mexican army, he never sent them to the Confederacy to fight the Union. And the Mexican-American War would, con or not the Mexican-American War, the Mexican-French War, sorry, the war between France and Mexico would continue till 1867. That's how long the Mexican army bravely fought against them. And that was two years after the American Civil War had ended. So this victory helped keep the French army occupied, which allowed the Union to win the Civil War. It allowed us to have the outcome that we did. And 
when news of the victory of the Battle of Puebla reached Colombia. It was about three weeks later. The Latino community, the Californios here, celebrated. They fired their guns into the air. They danced. They played music. They made food. They gave impromptu patriotic speeches celebrating the victory at the Battle of Puebla and democracy and freedom. And this celebration here in Colombia is the first recorded one in the United States. So Colombia, the little town of Colombia, was the very first place that the victory of the Battle of Puebla was celebrated and why we still celebrate Cinco de Mayo here today. Now, this holiday, it would be best viewed as a Civil War holiday started by the Latino community in California. And even though Mexico would go on to lose the war with France after the United States had reconstructed itself, they turned and looked and saw that France was still here. And then they used that little Monroe Doctrine I told you about earlier. They joined forces with the Mexican president and they helped push the French empire out of Mexico. So again, the Battle of Puebla here, the Cinco de Mayo celebration, is celebrating freedom and democracy in this dark time. And not just US history, but in Mexican history of these two countries that were losing battles. And this little victory helped bring a little light in a dark time. And that's one of the reasons that we can still celebrate Cinco de Mayo here in the United States. They may not celebrate it in Mexico, but it is still celebrated all around California and here in Colombia, the birthplace of the celebration. So I hope you all enjoyed our short little presentation here, taking a brief look at some of the history of Cinco de Mayo and just a few of the many contributions of our Hispanic gold miners here. And I want to encourage you to, if you're ever able to come up here, you can actually celebrate Cinco de Mayo here in Colombia. But if you can't, well, you can still celebrate it in your own way where you're at. So again, I hope you all enjoyed this and I hope you all have a wonderful and happy Cinco de Mayo. So thank you all for coming. And I'm gonna do a quick little spin around again to show you a little bit of the town here in Colombia. So thank you all again for coming, and I hope that I can see y'all here one day in Colombia. Have a good one, everybody.